Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we're mostly going to be talking about some reporting over the last couple of days on Panasonic's investment in Tesla's Gigafactory Nevada, a couple other news stories to go through, and of course, we also have to talk about the stock price. Tesla stock continues to set new all-time highs, today passing through the $2,000 stock price mark for the first time. Although it does feel like a while ago at this point, Tesla stock first crossed $1,000 per share back on June 10th of this year. So it took about a decade for them to get to $1,000 per share and only about 70 days more to get to 2000 This share price milestone also happened to coincide with a nice Tesla daily milestone. The podcast was started three years ago today on August 20th, 2017. And last year on the second anniversary, I also announced that I would be taking Tesla daily full time. So it's been a year since then. I like to use these anniversary episodes to check in on sort of the behind the scenes of Tesla Daily, where we've been, where we're going, but I know not everybody is interested in all that, so I'll keep that to a separate episode, which will be a second episode for today, coming out a little bit later after this one. Keep an eye out for that, and I will put a link to that in the description when it is available. All right, so over the last couple of days, we've had some news on Panasonic's investment in Gigafactory, Nevada. Yesterday, the Nikkei Asian Review published an article where they said, quote, Panasonic will boost production capacity of batteries for Tesla next year in an investment expected to exceed $100 million, Nikkei learned on Wednesday. The investment will be made in Gigafactory 1, a battery plant in the U.S. state of Nevada, with 13 production lines. Panasonic will add another line, increasing capacity by 10% to 39 gigawatt hours per year, end quote. There are two other noteworthy items in this report, and then we'll circle back on that first part. But the report also says, quote, Panasonic is also upgrading the batteries being produced at Gigafactory, raising each battery's storage capacity by 5% starting in September, end quote. This piece got a fair amount of attention. I did want to point out that this had already been previously reported by Reuters at the end of July. We've talked about this. And the K-Asian Review here doesn't cite their source, so this isn't necessarily confirmation of the Reuters report from earlier. They could just be using that report in their own article here. So I won't spend too much time on that. Obviously, any energy density improvements are exciting. And then the other noteworthy point in this article is, quote, with annual production capacity set to exceed 1 million vehicles next year, the capacity for battery production is also likely to increase, Panasonic officials say, end quote. Unfortunately, the sentence structure here lacks a little bit of clarity about exactly what Panasonic officials say, whether that refers to the capacity for battery production also being likely to increase, or whether it refers to the annual vehicle production capacity set to exceed 1 million vehicles next year. If Panasonic's comments were about the battery production capacity increasing, the 1 million vehicle capacity may just be speculation from the Nikkei Asian Review. In addition to pointing that out, I think it's also worth remembering that production capacity doesn't actually equal vehicles produced. Technically, this is just saying that at some point next year, Tesla would have the capacity, production capacity installed to produce at that rate. So I saw some excitement about that particular portion of this article, but I don't think that should come off as too surprising considering Tesla's current stated production capacity is 690,000 vehicles. They say that will extend to 790,000 before the end of the year, and that is before accounting for any production capacity for Model Y from Giga Shanghai. Adding that alone, which we have already talked about the timeline for that likely surprising people, should take Tesla above a million capacity next year. Then you throw in capacity from Giga Berlin next year, and likely some capacity from Giga Texas next year as well. Really, Tesla should be closing in on a million and a half in capacity towards the end of 2021. I think it's really easy to forget just how much capacity Tesla has right now because of what we saw in the first half of 2020, both quarters being impacted by the COVID situation. So I think people have become accustomed to these 80 to 100,000 quarterly delivery numbers and production numbers from Tesla, but that was pre-ramp up of Gigafactory Shanghai and essentially with 30% of the first half being shut down. I think to some extent COVID has provided a bit of a sheath to Tesla's underlying capacity and it gets thought of as that company that, okay, right now per quarter makes about 100,000 vehicles, but really their production capacity right now today is closer to 200,000 than it is to 100,000. So we're sitting really on a doubling already before even accounting for that additional capacity from those other factories that I mentioned. Obviously, the stock price has risen quite a bit, so maybe the market is reflecting that, but I really I really just don't think, based on everything that I know and all the conversations that I have had, that that sort of production increase so rapidly isn't going to catch Wall Street a little bit off guard, at least in some pockets. Anyway, circling back to the rest of the article, Bloomberg had a report on this on Thursday that I actually found on the Tesla Motors Club's forums, which I think probably came from a Twitter post of a screenshot of a Bloomberg Terminal article that I have not been successful in tracking down anywhere else online, so I can't technically verify the existence of this article, but it looks legit. 
and provides a bit more context on this Panasonic news. Bloomberg has provided a couple of direct quotes from a Panasonic executive vice president who said, quote, We have decided on the additional investment because we are now sure the business will be profitable based on the current market demand, our capacity, and production efficiency. Demand for Tesla cars is clearly rising, end quote. This EVP also added that they hope to turn their Tesla business profitable this year on a 12-month basis, which we have talked about in the quarterly earnings releases from Panasonic before. It's important for the supplier to also be profitable, otherwise they are going to be hesitant to continue to invest. So we see that coming to fruition here, Panasonic turning profitable and then being willing to start to invest more aggressively. Good to see that additional context, I think, and also, of course, good to hear Panasonic speak positively of the demand for Tesla's vehicles. I'm sure they get a bit more insight to it than we do. Next up today, I wanted to briefly touch on the situation that is unfolding in California. As I'm sure many of you have heard, there have been a lot of wildfires in Northern California recently. Obviously not a new problem to California in general, but there has been a heat wave over the last few days, high winds, not a good recipe for fires. So far through today, those have spread through about 350,000 acres of California. That has forced some evacuations, both from obviously necessity and also precaution. So first off, thoughts go out to anybody impacted by that situation. But second, I think this highlights a couple of things. I think first, obviously, the impact of climate change and the urgency with which mitigation tactics and solutions need to be pursued. And then second, though this is more heat wave related than fire related, California has been dealing with significant blackouts over the last few days as the heat wave has caused power consumption and power needs to increase significantly. Governor Newsom said in a press conference, I believe yesterday, that California's power need went up to about 47 megawatts versus generally during this time of year, it would be at about 38. So about 25% more demand for power than would be typical for this period of time. The issues have generally arisen between 2 p.m. and 9 p.m., seemingly because of air conditioning requirements. The blame for these blackouts and the responsibility for not being able to meet those power consumption demands has been widely distributed, but one area that has come under focus has been California's reliance on renewable energy. Renewables like wind and solar amount for about 36% of California's energy generation. As we know, renewables can have intermittency issues, and that has taken some of the blame for these blackouts with California's independent system operator, according to the Wall Street Journal, blaming the blackouts on, quote, cloud cover, weak winds, and failures at a couple of power plants for this weekend's power outages, end quote. While this could be taken as an argument against renewables in general, I think it emphasizes the importance of both distributed generation through solar power. The more distributed it is, the less you have to be reliant on one place getting good sunlight, and then especially having enough distributed storage so that when there are intermittency problems, it can be compensated for. Utility scale storage can hopefully solve a lot of these problems, but if not, at least there is the opportunity nowadays to have that backup storage without having to rely on a generator. The other exciting part about residential storage, obviously, is that it can lead to the use of a virtual power plant, which I know Tesla is testing right now in Australia with, I believe, pretty good results so far. But that creates opportunity for you to not only back up your own home, but your neighbor's home or, you know, whoever across the way needs your energy. And that can all be handled instantaneously with software. And I think especially with distributed power generation and distributed solar, what often gets overlooked is that those costs are distributed as well. It's not up to the utility or the government to have that capital outlay to build these really expensive power plants or storage facilities when instead you could just have a million residents in your area buy a power wall. That is something that has the potential to scale up very quickly. And same thing with rooftop solar. It all comes down to affordability, and thankfully Tesla understands that. So I know I don't talk about energy quite as much, but for reasons like this, I am very excited about the business. I'm excited for the energy impacts from battery day that maybe most people aren't focused on right now. But I think there is the potential there for us to look back at battery day in a couple of years and say, yep, that was the inflection point for Tesla Energy. That is where we'll leave this episode, but again, there will be a second episode later tonight, so make sure you check that one out as well. Until then, thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and sign up for notifications. Make sure you're following me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you later on for that next episode. Thank you.